Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. My guest today is a longtime town councilman for the city of Danville. He has been mayor six times and a really, really intelligent, measured individual. Took an enormous amount of time to talk about a wide range of issues ranging from cell sites to fire protection to safety of the city to budgets. Tremendous information that I would likely never have thought to ask, but he took his time and provided. And again, I'm very, very thankful I got to hear hear all of this. It makes me feel even better about, about being a Danville resident. But without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Newell Arnerich. <laughs> And this was in high school? High school in Modesto, California. The same high school George Lucas did. Um, you know, real farming community. And I can't believe they let us start our own radio station. But we had to pay for it. So we went to, you know, there's a military base and stuff um, in Merced. Um, we got a transmitter that was donated. We went up, scared the heck out of us. We went to um, a group of radio stations in San Francisco trying to get old equipment. And we went to Coit Radio, K, um, KSFO, and they were really nice. Gave us their older stuff, which we thought was the latest and greatest technology. The best stuff ever. <laughs> and then we got to a radio station, and I was a pretty small kid. I didn't grow till the following year. And I probably looked like I was 12 years old. And we went to KSAN, which was alternative rock and roll. We walked into the station. It was only black lights. Every button had fluorescent light. There was smoke of you know what from one end of the room to the other. And they're coming in, yeah, we'll talk to you guys. And, and they didn't, the station manager had invited us, and I don't think we ran out of there fast enough. We were just had no idea what this was, but anyway. Right. Well, you won't find that in this room. I mean, no. I have a lot of I have a lot of SAT and ACT <laughs> books, but not uh, yeah, right. not glowing buttons and paraphernalia, yeah. unfortunately. So you you were saying your wife was working in the in, yeah, the inner in city education and, yeah. and still does. And you know, she started here. Um, it didn't start here, but her second job was um, at Montero Elementary, mm -hmm. um, kindergarten teacher. And we had hoped back in 87 our kids would be able to go to kindergarten there. But even then, with our population is a lot lower, schools were impacted. But she stayed in the district. And when um, small class size um, reduction for K-3 came up under Governor Pete Wilson's term, that was a big pivot. All of a sudden, there's 20 students in a class. And teaching was fundamentally going to change. And what it went from was teaching to the whole, that there are going to be kids, the bulk of the kids will be BC students, there will be a certain percentage of the BAs, and a certain percentage will fail. And that's where teaching was in a, you know, a very crude sense, but it was an individual. So she went back through with a grant that they had gotten from Basarik to go back and retrain teachers of how to do individual learning plans for each student, which wasn't done because you didn't have the... the you know, the, the, ability. the time and the resources, right. Right. And so you would have 18, maybe 20 students in a class. And instead of teaching a lesson and then half the kids get it and the other don't, and you just keep moving on, each child was allowed to move at their own pace. And success was huge. And that individualized learning and that sense of confidence, because each of us as humans have, you know, particularly, you know, traditionally you'll see boys who if they have late birthdays in a year, and that's how TK, transitional kindergarten, came to be, they didn't perform as well as, as girls. And so you would hold them back, you know, let them start. They're still five years old, but they turn six within two months. And all of those things um, came to um, fruition in the sense that you could teach to each one of those differences in that small class. And as you know, that's kind of went away over time because of budgeting. And unfortunately here in San Juan Valley, we have a wonderful school system, well supported, but people don't realize we're designated by these old formulas as a low wealth district. Now that's an oxymoron. What does it mean? It means, let's say in round numbers, we get over $7,000 a student and just to the south of us, they get around 12. Well, why? We pay more taxes per capita here but it's these old formulas that were done and nobody's been able to fight 
to change those. And so small class size reduction became absolutely a huge economic challenge and the state started taking away revenues even from school districts who get so little money. I mean, there's some school districts um, that get up to $18,000 a student. In theory, they have more difficult challenges. They have English as a second language challenges. They have a whole long list of stuff. But, you know, our school district has been able to figure out the ways in spite of all of those. You could sit around, just like the town of Danville. We could sit here as a town and say, wow, Prop 13, town of Danville didn't do so well. We got classified in a bucket where we basically got 7.2% of property taxes. Some place like Walnut Creek, more legacy cities have been around. They're 12, 14, 15%. What do we do? We have to live with our means. And, you know, um, back to school, school district here has done an amazing job with what little money they have. And, and people don't get that as parents. Well, I pay all these taxes. Yeah, you do. They don't go to the school district. Just like here in the town of Danville, our residents, nearly 93% of all the taxes they pay go elsewhere. You know, Danville, by default, we're the most cost-effective city around. And somebody says, oh, yeah, everybody says. I said, well, you're probably thinking 10%, 20 We're 100 to 300% more cost-effective than every city in this area. To the north of that, we spend round number $600 a resident. They spend $2,200 a resident. Do the same job. San Ramon, great city. They spend $1,380. So that's 200 to 300%. And if you go to Livermore, Dublin, and that, they're even higher. Um, so in the same way, the town of Danville, we have to philosophically live from our means, so we do business differently. Sunland Valley Unified School District does business differently within those financial means. And we all achieve high goals because we have great cooperation from our parents, our citizens, and we all accept that we want high standards and we're willing to pay sometimes extra for it. Now in the town, people don't pay anything extra. We just have to figure out contractual ways to provide services in the most cost-effective solution. So, you know, we're different and, you know, you know, God bless the school district for the, the achievements that they get to with the, the limited funds. And you can say, oh, that's their just complaint. No, they're not. Just look at the math statewide. It's just extraordinary the differences in how well. Right. I think the nuances and, and just the plain math and, and budgets, when you really look at it, and especially in comparison to other other places to the north or the south of us, it is really, really shocking. And there there are so many things coming up in, in all the interviews with the Board of Education people that I've been working through. And and if you look at any any conversation that's kind of going on around town, there are all these, you know, buzz topics like, oh, well, retroactive pay raises or, or the things with the teachers union. And I, I don't discredit any of those grievances or, or topics. I'm not saying we shouldn't discuss all these, but what's very, very clear is when you dig into the nitty gritty of how Danville and the San Ramon Valley Unified School District has been achieving the quality of life and quality of experience that it has, there is, it's almost like voodoo. You're kind of like, how, how is that possible that, say, Walnut Creek has 300 times or 400 times the budget per citizen than Danville has, and hey, I like living in Danville, right? right. And where, where I went to high school, Mount Diablo Unified School District, I'm not 100% sure on the numbers, but I know they're significantly higher per student oh, yeah. than, than San Ramon Valley Unified. Double. They're just right. about double. Right, and that was not an education that I would, that I would wish for a lot of people. I mean, it's, it was not, again, Ignatia Valley was not a fantastic, there was a riot when I was at school there. I think it was my junior or senior year, the SWAT team actually came. And I think um, my sister actually very fortunately did a master's in education. She wanted to become a, a teacher and did teach for some time. But she got her master's at Pepperdine and they, they dispelled, part of the program was dispelling myths about uh, LA school districts. And one of the things they did is they had to compare their high school where they went to school to the worst schools in Compton. At Ignacio Valley High School, again in Concord, had something like an 8% college readiness rating. Okay, now let, let's be really clear. This is 8% of the highest socioeconomic group in a certain class went to college. So if you looked at, say, like all the Caucasian or Asian students at Ignatia Valley, 8% of them were ready to move on to a four-year college and be successful. In Compton, it was 40%. 
So my sister came home, and she was about 24, and I remember she emailed us saying, oh my God, I just saw a film of these Compton high schools that are supposedly the worst in the state, and they have working facilities. Like, I think we only had one drinking fountain that worked at Ignacio Valley, and I never really thought of it. She was like, the bathrooms aren't like drug dens. The, the drinking fountains work. Almost half of the kids are ready to go to college. And to know that they have twice the budget that, say, Doherty Valley does or Monta Vista, San Ramon, Cal High, and the area here does such a better job with it, it's, it's really disheartening because you realize it wasn't, it wasn't a lack of ability. They could have done it. It, it appears to me to be more a lack of will. And, and capacity for people to think outside the box, for people to stretch budgets, for people to do, as you said, do business differently. Well, but, but you know, that's interesting. And, and I think on one level, there's truth to that, but it's not always the case. And, and here's a couple of reasons why. One, really high performing schools have something else in common. They're usually the safest communities around. Danville, we are singularly the safest community in the state of California. And it'll be this year would be the fourth year of that. We've always been in the top 10. So the school district as a whole, all of our cities, all these areas have all been in the top 10. That's first. So you have to have some common denominator. And if you live in an environment, like where my wife is doing this work uh, with a nonprofit, those, it is so, so dangerous to be at school. It's dangerous to be at home that all of those external issues get in the way of the functionality of attracting good teachers, of having a safe environment for the kids, or even the kids even be able to physically get to school, which is a huge problem in those areas. So one of the things that I think makes it different here, and, and, and I'll admit San Ramon has done the same thing, but many years ago in Danville, we made a partnership with our school district, recognizing nobody could change this, this unfortunate low wealth designation of a funding formula, which got us the lowest amount of money per capita in the state of California, that as a town, we partnered everywhere we could. So for example, the most recent project at San Juan Valley High School, um, they had a real parking problem. It was one of the, the four high schools in the area that had virtually about half the amount of parking. So we found a way when the school district was going to do a renovation, a beautiful project they did, we said, you know what, we can give you enough money and buy more parking places, but the way we'll do it, we'll pay to demolish those buildings and enough money to add that, add another story to your new project, and conversely, we'll get 240 new parking places. And by the way, when Danville builds downtown parking places, the land and the construction, land being most of the cost, it's $60,000 a space, we could get those 240 spaces for four or $5,000. Makes us look like financial geniuses but it was a win for the high school. The high school was gonna replace its dilapidated uh, swimming pool many years ago. And we said, hey, during the summer, while you're not in session, we can use it for swim programs and our recreation services. Why don't we pay to enlarge the pool? Um, we did that at Monta Vista High School. You look at um, Baldwin, Greenbrook, um, Green Valley, um, um, actually virtually all of the schools in Danville, we either maintain their um, playground space and turn it into a park so we can program soccer, baseball in the off seasons um, and do the maintenance for those. And by doing that, it took those limited dollars that our school district gets to put it exactly where it should be. And it's been those small partnerships or where we built um, after school teen programs. So on all three of the middle schools in Danville, we built our own building, they gave us the land, we staff it and manage it. Most high risk time for young teenagers to be at home by themselves is that sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So we built facilities and run a program after school to keep kids there. Right. Um, we also at their, um, uh, the gymnasiums when all those schools were remodeled, we enlarged those gyms so we can also do basketball programs and things. So those kinds of partnerships, and again, City of San Ramon did that. It was incumbent upon us to find ways to be partners. That's pretty unusual. 
You right. don't see that done. That takes foresight, though. That takes a lot of, hey, look, what are, what are the resources? You, you mentioned radio right out of the block. So I remember reading an article years ago about distribution of natural resources, and radio wavelengths were one of them. And I, n I had never thought about that. You're like, how is a wavelength a, a natural resource? And you realize, oh, it's something that theoretically this geographic area owns because you can't broadcast outside of that. There's a limited amount of it, and it's inherent in the earth, right? Or they can't uh, receive it because they need a repeater station, right. and they couldn't get a license to do that. Right, things like that. So you have, you have these resources that are just sitting there. They're just sitting there, and if people started thinking about it, like, oh, well, we could, you know, before it was abundant, right, and you didn't have that many people trying to broadcast, then you had more people trying to broadcast, and you could start making deals and, and actually doing things with it. And that type of thing, like you're saying, hey, look, we have this pool for the high school. Why don't we partner with them? We'll provide benefit to them. We'll help them repair it, but then we get benefit. So everybody right. wins. And it's the type of thing where it's – difficult to get people to see that far ahead or see the resources, just a pool of stuff sitting right in front of them that they can start drawing on where everyone wins. But it seems you've been at this long enough and it seems that you've found ways to do that, not just with the school district. I mean, like, as you were pointing out, we have the safest, safest city in California, which is tremendous. We have great school districts. We have fantastic quality of life, clean city, right? You go downtown. It's not a huge downtown, but it is a beautiful downtown. Right. So as, as is customary, people say, hey, look, we can do this better. Or, you know, people are always trying to, trying to say there's something better we can do. And one of the things that everybody comes up with in response is, hey, this was not done by accident. It was not done haphazardly. This was very carefully planned out and designed over the course of decades. What, what were some of the first things that you on the town council put into action that you have had the good fortune of seeing to come to fruition and, and really improve the town? Well, that's, I think that's the crux of the question. That is the distinguishing factor of really started 25 years ago and I'm not going to that's when I got on the council and I'm not going to take all the credit for it but you have to have the philosophy and it starts with a couple of things and it's a story I tell everybody who ever wants to get you know I, I, I would say every one of us the f current five members none of us are politicians we're just community volunteers who believe in public service and if you want to help people get involved if you want to be a politician, please go elsewhere. Just stay away. There are plenty of spots for you. <laughs> and, and, and here's what helps facilitate that. First of all, and most people don't know this, that in the state of California, all offices, all elected office, except for the 40 senators, 80 assembly members, and the seven statewide offices, all the rest of us are nonpartisan by law. So we can't advertise if we belong to a party. We can't say it from our lips. Big cities, people know because there are groups who want to sure. manipulate that. And, and it gets down to this, and I tell everybody that gets on the council that wants to get involved, look, you know, when you look at that pothole, all I see is a pothole. I don't see a liberal pothole or a conservative pothole. And we have two decisions to make. One, do you want to fix it? If we agree, that's great. And that second decision is how do we pay for it? Local government, everything you touch and feel in your life generally to get from your job, from your house to your job, local government provides. People don't realize even the freeway construction. Back nearly 20, 30 years ago, we had to start self-funding. So we formed a group with other cities, all 19 cities. There was only 17 in those days, but we had to form a way to fund construction because Caltrans, 93, 94, really got out of the business of building roads. So it takes a philosophy of looking at what you have and how do you best leverage that. So we couldn't afford to go out and buy more park space. And you know, in Danville, land here is three to six million dollars an acre and you need 30 acres to build a park. Well, that's 20, 15 years worth of our budget. You just can't afford to do that. So it, it became to me logical and we had a school board that was willing to listen to us um, and the willingness of those of us on the council, myself, who had somebody in, in a wife teaching in the district and stuff, we saw this benefit. The schools really needed help. We needed park space. 
wow, we could take over a very small cost, start maintaining as developments were built in Danville back in the 90s, we could say, you know what, we're going to carve out, instead of paying, building a mini park, that park space will go to a brand new school. So like out at Sycamore, for example, the school district only had to pay for the exact property the school is sitting on. All those playgrounds are actually in park space that the town owns. So we all win by that, and we maintain it because we have a lighting and landscape district that can could absorb it in those days. So to the community, it was it seemed like our school district and the town were really partners, and we've tried to maintain that. Financially, it's more challenging to do that today, but just as I said at San Ramon Valley High School, we added something that our neighbors desperately needed, that the neighborhoods were well impacted. But we went along with that. Everything that we look at, we, unlike other cities, we contract out services. So like maintenance, we may have a dozen people working in maintenance, that are town employees, but we may have 80 people a day that work for three different companies that we competitively bid, one to do roadside maintenance, another company does parks, another one does buildings. Those contracts have 30-day cancellations. Back in the downturn of the economy, we canceled all the contracts. We rebid them. They came in 20 to 30 percent lower because people said, you know what, we're in a terrible economy. I want to keep what I can. Right. Most cities can't do that. There's out laws now that kind of prevent that. We have been one of those because we've been doing it for 25, 30 years. We can get away with doing it, but it's really cost effective. So if you work for the town of Danville, you're going to be a really highly skilled person. And for those jobs that we can contract out on a competitive basis, we do. And it's been a great model. So instead of like most cities, somebody our size of 43,000 people would probably have 280 300 employees. Um, we have 30 police officers and we have just barely a hundred people working for us. Um, so that in itself, downturn economy, you can cut back on those contracts, make them more competitive, um, and it's what has helped us. And we made a pivot um, two and a half decades ago that we're not on a defined pension. So you never hear Danville in the news like say Walnut Creek or somebody else that right. might have a four or five hundred million dollar unfunded liability or three hundred million to the south, we have zero because we went to a 401k plan. It's technically a 401b, but it's essentially right. the same Right. Uh, so you go away from defined pension to defined contribution and then perhaps something is something right. even more So when an employee, aggressive. yeah, employee um, walks away from us and employees stay, we've just had kind of our first wave of retirement. People work for us for 30 and 35 years. Um, they have a good package to go away with, but we don't owe anything else. So we don't have those liabilities. That's helped us become that lean, highly efficient. Um, and technology, you mentioned, why are we the safest? People say, well, gosh, 30 police officers for 43,000. I says, yeah, it's pretty low. But in this community, so many of us work in tech and high tech that we invested in high tech. You can't get in or out of Danville without us knowing it. And if you're a bad guy, it takes 180 seconds. For example, at the Living and Mercantile, um, just prior to COVID, um, a um, murder um, felon happened to be using a car that was registered and his name was associated to it. Warrants were out for his arrest. Ended up to stop at a ice cream place at the livery and 180 seconds later, all of our officers, five on duty at the time, they were there. No incidents, arrested them. That's the difference in Danville. Or if uh, somebody breaks into your house, happens sometimes during the day, and somebody said, yeah, I saw a little white, um, maybe a Toyota. Our system is so robust, we can type in white car between these, these times, and I'll be honest, we'll probably eliminate all the Danville plates first. Pops it up, catches the car going on and off the freeway, we had a case right after we installed it. Two hours later, it lists that car sitting in a driveway in Stockton, California. PD calls up Stockton, says, hey, can you go by? They go by. Before they go to the front door, the car is sitting there in plain view, iPads, things that may sure. not look right, knock on the door, hey, is that your stuff? Turns out those were all stolen items from Danville. Same thing, chase some to East, other East Bay cities. It's that technology 
Our initial investment was about $1.2 million, and over the past four years, we've had it up. We've upgraded to an even more robust system. We probably have $2 million in the system, but that's why we're the safest city. Right. And, and the bad guys know it. They know if you come to Danville, the odds are you're going to be arrested. Because nationwide, you have a 89% chance of getting away with a crime. Only 11 percent all countywide. It's about 17. In Danville, we solve 40 to 60 percent of every crime, and we put the resources, and we have a we have a wonderful opportunity with our sheriff's department as a partner. When we need more detectives, we'll pay the overtime and the extra, get them to come to Danville, work these cases, go after them, and that's where cities fall short, that they don't have the resources. But per capita, since we get so less uh, money, the value proposition people told us, we want to live in a safe community. So that's really our number one priority. And we found the economic tools and the ways to make it happen. And the fact is the more um, energy and money we put into stopping crime, the less we have to solve. Right. So we've made a self-fulfilling prophecy that we don't have as much crime because we prevent it from happening. Therefore, we don't have to spend as much as other people. Right. And there was that big wave a um, uh, few years back of smash and grab things right off Sycamore, you know, in like the morning home area, mm -hmm. where they were just busting in those big French, French doors that a lot yep. of people had, grabbing things, and they were gone. That only persisted for, for like a month or something. And you'd hear about it. There was somebody at our, at our preschool. Um, my boys went to a Noah's Ark, which is attached to St. Timothy's on yeah. Diablo. They were going there, and there was one of the, one of the families there, a horrific incident that, that happened to them, right? And everybody scrambled to help them get their front door reinstalled and everything. But that disappeared. Right, like we heard about it, and it was it was hot hot topic in the neighborhoods. Like, oh my right. gosh! I mean, luckily I live in the Cameo neighborhood, so it's pretty far off the freeway. There weren't a lot of right. exits to get. I mean, to get back to the freeway, you got to go down Stone Valley or Diablo, and that's not going to be fast. So, luckily we were a little removed from it. But I, I told somebody else this. Um, we had an incident where uh, about two years ago, my sister in law had had left our front gate open. And we have this, I built this like three rail farm style um, fence around our front yard because I have boys and they're runners and we, we didn't want them to get hit or anything. So I built this gate and the gate has a cowbell on it to, to let us know when somebody comes. We had little babies. We didn't want anybody to ring the door, but we wanted to know when, you know, Amazon dropped something off. My sister-in-law had come and visited and left and not shut the door all the way. So around 2 a.m., the wind, we have a slight breeze, blows our gate open and the cowbell goes off. Well, it's uh -huh. 2 a.m. So my, yeah. my wife and I jump up, like, call bolt up, right, right. So call we call the, the dispatch. They are literally there in 90 seconds. And it's 2 a.m. And not just one of them, three cars swept up and down our street for about 15 minutes. Yeah. And, and we finally figured out, oh, she had come, she left the door ajar, and we were looking all over our property. But it was so fast. It it, it, you knew the city was taking it seriously. Everybody knew yeah. that it was it was an issue, and and nobody was happy about it. But to see that level of response so quickly, we're like, oh, oh, if you're a criminal, you have no chance. Right. Like all it takes is one person reporting you, and you have under, uh, you know, ninety seconds to get out of here. And that's the key. So that's exactly what you did, Todd. That is what we need. We need people to call us. So our community policing. The partnership with this community is the message. If you hear a noise, call us. Right. Because even if it turns out that it isn't, great. But the fact is, is everybody knows we're going to be there. And I think that's the partnership we have. People have put in, um, you know, all of the software for doorbells that have cameras on their front garages. The light comes on. What's nice is with most of those companies, you can then, when you sign up for the, the online service, you can also say, hey, I will share this information when requested with the police department. So we have this robust list. It's like a giant network, like right. a web. Our camera system right. gets bigger. And, you know, over time, the first year we had it up and running, first two years, we realized we had gaps. And, boy, every time an incident, we could close the gap. And as we did it, we now have a really robust. We had a gap that happened, um, if you remember, at uh, Costco. Mm -hmm. There were two smash-and-grab incidents. And they had figured out where the gap was. And boy, we had that fixed. And by the way, if you have a neighborhood 
that there are certain incidents, you know, just people causing problems, knocking over gas cans, sure. test cans. We have portable cameras. So our team will come out and we'll set up cameras. You don't even see these just in a neighborhood to kind of see what's happening in that neighborhood. Oftentimes it's not serious crime because, as you say, if you're not close to the freeway, and that's why the freeways are open, you cannot get in or out of Danville, no matter where you're coming from, without it being recognized. So if you are that bad person coming to do something, you're going to be caught. You know what's so interesting about the different programs you talk about? Um, say it's maintenance, or say it's police, or say it's this camera system. It's really clear that you guys have planned out a permanent a permanent system, right, where you have X number of police officers, you have these cameras set up, and, or you have this maintenance group, but you can contract that. That service can swell as necessary and then shrink back down to be very, very lean. So it's not that you don't have the capacity, but you just don't pay for that standing infrastructure. You don't pay for those standing contracts. You don't pay for anything that you're not absolutely needing in that moment. And and then, like you're saying, look, we don't have to install cameras we'd like to, perhaps, but we don't have to install them with this pace everywhere because we can move into those areas as is necessary right. and have these mobile camera systems. And I'm sure it costs a fraction of, of what it would cost to actually install permanent fixtures everywhere. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting. Back when, uh, you know, the Great Recession, um, that October 2008, a couple of things that were interesting. Um, you know, it was from Friday to the Monday morning. That Monday morning, so then President George W. Bush and the team met that Sunday, and they decided to bail out. So they did the massive bailout. They didn't bail out Lehman and a couple. But what they did was they bailed out our currency. Had they not did those things, and I don't care what party you belong to, this has nothing to do with it. This is economics. Danville at the time had $88 million in the bank on Friday. No matter what they did, we still would have had $88 million in the bank that day because the way we invest money is so safe, so secure. But they saved a lot of communities. And as you saw as time went on, a lot of cities had debt. Danville has zero debt. Now, why don't we? We can't afford it. We have right. to pay cash. So when we built the library, we built uh, the veterans building, we have to wait. It takes seven, eight, ten years to save the money. That's not popular when you get elected. People expect you to do things. And I always tell newer council members, look, that's a great idea. And if we all agree to it, that's good. Now we're gonna save the money. What do you mean? I says, you know, and you, you have to, if you're gonna take that money, are we taking it away from something else? Can we do that? We also do 10-year budgets. Cities don't do 10-year budgets because they don't want to know the answer. <laughs> what I mean is they really don't want to know, I want what I want today. Yeah, well, Vallejo didn't want to know the answer yeah, either. And they, yeah. And, and so that's that kind of philosophy. Our staff has been that way. Um, we have to live within our means. And again, when you have very little money, every decision counts. Um, I, one of my the companies I, I have owned for 42 years, we work with a lot of financial services companies, um, two of the largest ones in the United States. And watching them, they make so much money so lucrative in what they sell, they can make bad decisions in spite of their self, but the momentum keeps them going. In case of the town of Danville, we have so little financial resources. Again, an oxymoron of, gosh, I pay a lot of taxes, but because of those old formulas that we can't change, we have to live in our means. And it means every single decision we make, we have to be careful, cautious, and if we build something, What's the effect of that 10 years from now? What's the maintenance cost? Will we be able to do that? Um, and, and we have had um, a great consensus with the people that have been on our council over the past few years. Um, so in this election coming up, you know, there's, there's you know, two incumbents running, nine people. There's three seats. It's important to get people on there that have that philosophy because it doesn't exist anywhere. There are 482 cities in California. How many of those don't have any debt? It's less than one hand. How many of those don't have defined pension problems? Two, and by the way, Lafayette and, and Danville, maybe a little, little bit of Orinda, um, were unique. And that defined pension problem, that's that's the elephant in the room that oh. nobody's paying attention to. I mean, uh, you talk about uh, places the south or the west. I mean, I won't go specific, but 
it, if you're paying attention at all to the issue of defined pension, then you know what a behemoth is coming down the road for so many municipalities, so many counties, all of these different areas that have continued to elect people that had a more right now centric, like this this tax cycle, let's get these things done instead of looking of, okay, let's wait for seven or eight or nine or 10 years. They have these liabilities now that they keep kind of putting band-aids on and shoving down the road instead of saying, look, we got to square away with this. But it would be apps at this point for the vast majority of local politicians. It almost seems that to address the issues that, to be fair, they likely inherited, to address the issues and the pain that will be involved in that to deal with a 400 million, five, a billion dollar of liabilities, it would be absolute suicide. You'd have to have somebody who wanted to go in for literally one term and somehow get people on their side and make these tough calls and then be ready to be voted out immediately because nobody would be happy with it. But man, that's to have Danville in a, in a strong position where we can pay cash go through these economic ups and downs, and we may be at the start of one, we may be at the end of one, we don't really know what tomorrow's bringing. But to know that, hey, look, our businesses are not doing that well, but we're trying to do everything we can to get them back on their feet, and the town of Danville is not gonna crumble. Right. We're, we're going right. to we're going to continue trying to, for instance, block off the street and, and support those local businesses. We're going to continue trying to, you know, support the, the school board and figuring out creative ways to deal with the with the shortfall. Um, speaking of school, if I may ask you, you guys have have ushered in an incredibly safe time for Danville, which is wonderful. But it seems that there's still an ever growing anxiety about the safety of of this area and and one way that to to see that is obviously the schools there my my boys went to originally green um green valley elementary and one of the big issues that everybody kept talking about was hey we need a closed campus we need fences around this whole thing we need one entrance one exit we need the whole thing and the teachers there for the most part when i would speak with them privately they're like what are we doing I've been here 20, 30 years. We don't, we've never had an incident. And it seems to be the messaging. It seems to be the communication. Absolutely. What, what do you think is driving that? Because it doesn't appear to be driven by a by number of incidences. Quit watching the news. Ah! I mean, think about it, that the yeah. news is so much rhetoric, so much it's fake, it's that. And, and, and it's the news that's controlling our lives in the wrong way. And it's really hard if you tune out and start stick to the focus you got to get local news i mean how many people if we were in a room here of 500 people you know 15 years ago if they raised their hand they all took the local newspaper San valley times sure how many people today you know it's a pretty small number and just think about it they used to have 1200 employees at a huge facility um at their um contra costa times newspaper facility there's probably 30 people that work there now I, I threw the Contra Costa Times. I was a paper boy. I was a paper wow. boy from the Modesto B. Look at know, that. Back in the slave labor. So they days. have literally 30 to 40 people working there. Right. And, oh and, and there gosh. are 26 newspapers that they're part of in the Bay Area. So what happens is, is we get this rhetoric, and, and to be honest, thank God we're nonpartisan here, that we're caught and have been for, for quite some time where there's just so much rhetoric. Oh, it's your fault, and it's horrible, and if you don't vote for me, you know, everything's gonna fall apart, and you know, the crime's gonna happen, and all of this. No, everything you touch and feel is local. I'm sorry, all those people in those partisan office, just put a muzzle on them for a while, to be honest. And are there good people there? Absolutely, there's some good people. But the other ones are just talking heads, uh, to be blunt. And what they want to talk about is to create fear, reasons that they are creating value for you. So make people afraid of things. So th the flip side of that is we do have s the safest community. We have safe schools. But let's be honest, and, and I'm part of Discovery Counseling Center for the past 20 years, which is immersed in our schools with mental health counselors, and we're, I think we're up to about two days a week at every single, the 36 schools here. And our caseloads are full, and they have been for years. And if you think about it, and this is really a sad statement, and it's not an exaggeration, it's just the truth. Col incidents like Columbine don't happen in places like Oakland and lower socioeconomics. They only happen in affluent communities. And look them all up. 
They look them in places where you don't have, um, you have kids that are in very safe environments, but they're not resilient. They're not resilient to turmoil, to things don't work out their way. And unfortunately, we have um, those incidents where they had here. So the school district did change. Our police changed with them. That's when we put, and we still have, except they're not in session now, at our high schools, and San Ramon does the same, that we have community resource officers, which are sworn police officers on campus. And it is there to help build friendships, build bonds, find those, those young people who are troubled. And we find with the counselors at Discovery Counseling Center, the most important thing to do is when you find somebody in stress, is to say, this too shall pass that other people, it's normal to have those feelings, but it's how you deal with those feelings, that's the lessons that we all have to learn. And so when the school district said, we're going to have to respond, not because there was anything happening or that it did happen, but the odds are it's communities like this that things do happen. So the, the greater investment into mental health counseling um, and to prevent suicide and all of those things. So our community is healthier. We require um, this was a big pivot. We started um, with our counselors at Discovery Counseling Center. We all know first aid, right? We've all taken a first aid class, and if somebody's hurt, you know what to do. What happens when you walk down the street and you're walking um, into a grocery store and you see a young person, and you can tell they're in emotional stress? You walk around them because you don't know how to deal with it. So we found that there was this organization called Mental Health First Aid. It was a two-day first aid class in how to deal with something. Didn't teach you how to solve the problem, how to engage, because when you look at um, particularly teen suicide, it's the most preventable event just by intervening with a conversation. It's all it takes. You don't have to be skilled. You don't have to know what's, just say, hey, I, I noticed that things aren't going well. What's going on? That's enough to pivot that person to begin to open up and let out what's inside. So we required all of our police officers, so did San Ramon. We went to the school district and partnered with them to get all the teachers to take mental health first aid. All of our recreation counselors, all the people that dealt with young people. And we became a mental health oriented community and we still are, are in that process. And we have been now for eight and a half years. So keep your eyes open, listen, as you've talked about events when a group of parents see things going on. So we had to put safeguards in place. And you know what? Thank God nothing has ever happened here. Are there threats? Absolutely there's been threats. Some make it to the public, some don't. But it just means that there's a good network of parents, good network of police, of mental health counselors, and the system to be out there to respond and to, to go to a higher level. But all of those resources are hidden in our, our schools everywhere. They're hidden in our recreation programs. That makes a healthy community. Right, right. And to your point, I, I, have, a, I have a lot of students that go to one of the high schools in the Mount Diablo School District uh, in, in Walnut Creek, and they had a scare. They had a student who came onto campus with, with a firearm. Um, I think it was last year or the year before. And... I remember reaching out to all of those kids, all of the kids that I worked with, uh, either during that time or, or previously, and just said, hey, what, what's going on? You guys all right? Do you want to come to class and, and hang out? But all of them all of them responded so well. Some of them opened up more and really wanted to talk about it, and some of them didn't. But I realized just, just pinging them and just saying, hey, you, are you guys still at right. school? How are you doing? You know, exactly. everything good, right? Because like, if you're not good, you just tell me, and just, we'll work it out. But... I think that the younger people, especially looking back on it, they responded so positively. I didn't have any backlash. And all it took was, was a simple text message. As you're saying, just engage. Hey, are you okay? Because yeah. this is a little crazy. They you don't know? have the life experiences. And because, you know, Todd, in your work in tutoring, you know so well the personalities of the people you work with. You can even tell by a text how they're feeling. And you're right, just making that contact. And young people are growing up in life wanting to be independent. You know, here we are as parents. That's our job, make them independent. But we hover over them so much, right. we don't let them be independent. And they're not quite as resilient. Um, right. But, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the message we tell through counseling is to everybody. Just touch in base with people. Hey, right. hi, how's it going? Hey, 
what's what's new in your life? Right. What, right. What, what's happening? And and they may tell you something sad. They may tell you something po- positive. But whatever it is, they're talking. And as humans, boy, that's what COVID has showed us. We need to talk to each other. We need to meet with people. And it's healthy, and it's just how we we relate to the world. Right. And talk about what a difficult difficult time it is for for students to relate to each other now. I mean, they can't yeah. can't really see each other. But th- you know, what's interesting about what you said that that we we really take care of our kids, and so they're a little less resilient. It's it always seems to be a, an enormous balance because you have, obviously, to be a member of this community, you have to have really pushed hard in some capacity. And you likely want your kids to have better than you had. I think that's what most Absolute people have. Balance. That's yeah. right. That's that's the goal most people have for their life. And you obviously don't want your your young people to to experience the same kind of difficulty that you did. But one of the other things, I think that's a very classic explanation of why people take care of their kids so much and make things a little bit easier for them. But I think the other thing that is missing there is recognizing how much we are asking our young people to do. And I am not advocating ask less. In fact, I think we should ask more and tell them, hey, buck up. This is how it's going to go. But right. what what's really interesting is you realize, okay, parents complain about, I do everything for my kid. I make his lunch. I make his breakfast. I drive him to sports. I wash his clothes. All these things. And great, great. You, you take care of your kid. What do you think the odds are your kid could go to school for nine hours a day and study calculus and AP physics and then go to lacrosse practice for two and a half hours and then come home and do homework and meet with like a tutor and then pass out around 11 o'clock if you weren't doing these things for him? I mean, the, the ask is so tremendous. And I, I when I was growing up, I had parents that were less engaged and... I had to I had to take care of all of these things myself. You know, I had paper routes so I could buy food and, you know, everything. I was not as successful as I see my students being. Right? I was in calculus and I was in physics and stuff, but I wasn't I wasn't the four point five student that these students are. Because I didn't have people taking care of it. And as I think we need to really take a step back and realize, hey, look, we don't get it both ways. We don't get an incredibly resourceful, incredibly independent kid. And have a 17-year-old who can be in second year of calculus and on sports and in music and doing all these things at the same time. We kind of have to we kind of have to make a trade-off. It's like, okay, if you're not going to be super super high functioning, you can kind of you know work this out yourself. If you want to go for the gold, you got we got to recognize that you're going to have to trade some of these things. You're not going to have time to do your own laundry. But I mean, that's that's a that's a pet peeve of mine that we ask right. so much in both ways from from our young people. Um, Talking about downtown, talking about the businesses, you guys have done a great job responding in in shutting off parts of the street, trying to promote business. I mean, who could have seen the wildfires coming that, that limited that even more? But it seems that everything has been done that you guys could at this point. What more can be done as we move forward right. into the winter months, as it gets a little bit colder, theoretically, who knows if it will. So but that's what the do we real, do? Yeah, absolutely. Ton. That's the question. And we ask, we ask that every day. And, you know, even when, as we recovered through the Great Recession, um, you know, whatever we did this year, then the next year, we had to do something different. You know, retailing and how people interact. And and what we're going to find is, and this is the sad part, and we'll get the statistics here in the next two weeks, it's to show how much online purchasing that we pivoted to. And the problem is most people won't go back. It's easy. It was convenient. You know, you got what you want, and they'll pick it up and take it back. We're going to see those sales went way up. Um, you know, restaurants are the biggest challenge. Um, they employ an average restaurant. Most people don't know this. About 140 people per restaurant. So somebody like Bridges, really, I think they were 140 people. Wow. They told us. Um, Salitos, um, you know, the New Mexican restaurant. Um, they have 125 people. So those are big employers. So And, and we have a lot of re- really wonderful restaurants. So we did, we did pivot a lot to try to find opportunities. We're doing a meeting tomorrow morning to look at, okay, we didn't work on this street. What can we do different? Um, and then we have to talk about the brick-and-mortar stores. What are the things that we can do to help them? First of all, marketing to make sure people know. So we have switched to individualized to a group marketing 
Um, we have a much stronger relationship with the Chamber of Commerce that does hands-on. You know, we just lost, unfortunately, Zay Perrin, just a, a, a guru of the digital footprint to take some of the traditional brick and mortar stores who were not on the internet, got them there. Um, Shelby McNamara, a seasoned former retired uh, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce is back to fill in and she you know, doesn't miss a beat. She went out and started interviewing every business with one of our staff in the town. What is it we can do different? What do you think? What are the trends that you're seeing? And I've been walking, and other council members walking, I, you know, I probably virtually know every single um, restaurant owner in here. I talk to them, find out what are they seeing, what are their numbers like, and as you mentioned, Todd, weather. So in talking to Supervisor Candace Anderson, as the chair of the County Board of Supervisors, she mentioned it looks like tomorrow that the county will announce, because the state is announcing, that we'll move to the next tier down to the red, so restaurants can open for interior dining. But what it'll be is be limited to 25% of their capacity or 100 people, whatever is less. Now, at 25% capacity, restaurants will go bankrupt. No question, if they don't also have the outdoors. Somebody told me the other day, they're like, well, 25%, you know, maybe you're not making that much money. I'm like, are you, are we talking about the same business? They're, like, if, if they're not at 80% capacity, they're right. not breaking even. You know, like you gotta really get people into that spot. The the yeah. the profit margin's so thin. The rent structure and everything. I mean, we have one. I won't tell you which one, but it's one of our newer, really great restaurant. Their rent is twenty six thousand dollars a month. <laughs> so, you know, and the formula oh is your gross. It it takes food cost wow. is a third. Labor is a third. Profit overhead rent is a third. Well, that's assuming you're making a profit. They're so far behind in rent that even at full capacity, they could go bankrupt right. because that debt is out there. You know, we've tried to work with landlords. I've personally called landlords and said, hey, you know, if you think you're going to be the only business entity in the downturn in the economy that's not going to get hurt, you're on another planet. And they said, well, I got a lease. You know, it's a contract. I said, we all have contracts. I right. own two companies, I have contracts, but I'm a human being to know that it's just not going to be the same. Right. So some landlords in Danville have been fantastic, but the bottom line is like tomorrow, we're looking back on Hearts, Hearts all the way down to um, Church Street. We had closed it for a month, like we said. It hurt some businesses, it helped others. Some have come back. I, um, what I'm hearing is we're still in that quandary. So we've got to figure out to do something to help those businesses in different ways. Maybe we have to change and only do a, a Saturday, Sunday or something like that, drop Fridays. But where we have done it, you know, between Prospect and Diablo in there, that's a home run. At Bridges, the Vine, um, and, and Harvest, Harvest right. that we permanent because that's a cul-de-sac. So we, the town, we own it. We're looking at now making that a plaza, put lights, put a fountain Beautiful. in there and removable bollards. So during the winter, it's open because you want to drive in, get into the restaurants. But the bottom line, we're telling restaurants, okay, what can you do differently in your plan? Are there outdoor facilities that you could still use? You know, that just like when it gets cool in the summer, you have heaters, what are the things you can put in place now to preserve as much as your outdoor dining as possible? Um, and secondly, at that 25%, but who can help this? You and I can help. It's like when I walked in with my mask today. If we just wear the mask at the right time, the reason our numbers are down and we're going to be able to do this, it's that simple. This isn't politics. It works. It is that simple. And if we do this, we can keep ourselves in there. What would be great is to get back up to 50 to 100%. And all it takes, and, and I will encourage everybody, the more people that test, the more people that test, like you and I, we're going to test negative for, for COVID. That helps those statistics in that pool. We had so few people testing. We're getting a higher percentage of people. It's a deadly disease, no question. The statistics show that. But the more people get tested, the more we can open. But the backup is that, holding my hand here, is wear a mask and it works. I mean, our schools, as you know, have announced, I think it's October 19th, they're going to reopen with some in class. If um, I may ask you yeah. one, one more time to, to hit a point. Because fewer people were testing, 
generally people were only testing if they weren't feeling good or, or you know, they had some the high suspicion, risk higher, higher risk population. But because of that, you get a pool of people that have a suspicion or a higher risk of contracting this. And that skews the numbers within this little area. So if you actually had a larger swath of the population testing, then... But that wasn't true in the beginning. So that sounds reasonable. But the reason why it wasn't true in the beginning was because our hospitals were filling up. Mm -hmm. And what we know by New York standard, when you don't have spe people, space for people who are sick in the hospital, they died at incredibly high rates. Mm -hmm. So in Contra Costa County, they got set up temporary ICUs. It swelled up. The ICUs completely filled up. But... Why were they filling up? It's because people were testing. Yeah, they might have had signs, but they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm okay. They got tested and found out, boy, you're in a high-risk group. You do have it. But now we've gotten over that as long as the things that are basically in place. So now right. it is incumbent not to game the system statistically. It's to get a more robust, a robust database of who really is, where are those high-risk groups. And it may mean the more people we test, and let's say we're finding it's only at a certain type of business when you trace back, then we go put protocols in place right. which protects our other businesses. Right. But otherwise, we're all being put into that same pool because we don't know where it's coming from. So now is the time to get tested. Now is the time to trace back. How did you get it? Who are the people associated with you? Right. Determine what we know. Um, uh, senior care facilities, oh my God, we did not clearly, and, and our health officers will say it, nationwide, we did not have standards of which we should have had for the sanitation, the protocols in places, even for flu and things like that. We had a facility um, some years ago that had such high rates of flus, they were prohibited for two years from taking any new patients. That financially about put them out of business. So in the same sense, now is the time to test. It's not gaming the system. It is getting the volumes up to know where are those people, where are they coming from. Wrap our arms around them, put that protective like we do in Danville, that uh, you know, um, uh, uh, force shield, shield, force shield around force Danville shield, yeah. to keep the bad guys out. We need a force shield around those business entities that have these high rates, put protocols in place so that the rest of business can go on. Right. And that's really where we're at. So that's, you know, there was a political, oh, yeah, we could test more. And that, that wasn't politics. That was really to drive people in and know how many more beds we needed at the time. We have managed that. And now what we need is to know where it's coming from and deal with it. Not necessarily shut them down, but put protocols in place that may need to be higher. But this right. simple mask here, my goodness, it made a difference. Right. And look in Danville. When do you see somebody not with a mask in the appropriate places? 99.9% .9 of the time. And you'll see somebody, you know, I go to Lenardi's almost every day. I know everybody there. And one guy walks in and I go, and he goes, oh, before I even said yeah. it, he goes, oh my God, it's in my car. I'll be right back. <laughs> and we've all done that. But yeah, the fact right. is, is it's ingrained to us. And by the way, we're going to be doing this probably for another year. And you know what? Two years from now, there's going to be something else. But I tell you, the good that's coming out of this, the scientific research, that we may be able, because you know, the cold, the common cold is a coronavirus. COVID-19 is a coronavirus with different certain aspects sure. to it. We solve this, we're gonna solve a lot of things and we'll be better prepared next time as a nation, our scientific community, the database that we have now. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a positive person. As sad as it is in the 200,000 lives we've lost in the United States and a million worldwide, you know, that's not in vain. Right. You know, right. We They're are good going come from to it. come out right. of this so much better. And the next time something like this, it really will be just like a common flu. Right. And uh, let me be very clear. I wasn't intending to imply that you were emphasizing we game right. the system right. with testing. But I think people also don't. It's just such a. It's such a broad topic, oh, absolutely. right? And and whenever and there's you, politics, to right? It. <laughs> and that's the thing. Whenever you start talking about testing, you always get you know the conspiracy theorists, and then you get the crazy right, crazy left, and it's like, oh, forget it. I can't even deal with yeah. it. But go yes, get a test. Yeah, Please, right. Go get a test. So now. what? It's hard to explain to people that you have 
you guys have orchestrated this this safety uh, net over the entire city in a lot of different ways, fiscally, um, you know, from a from a criminal standpoint, educationally, we've really taken care of ourselves. How how is it that you guys shifted to such a longer term view, and what are things that you perhaps would have liked to see come sooner? For instance, you said you got a plan ten years out. Okay, that means you're probably at year five for things you hope. Come, come to fruition in another few years from now. What are those things that you're really looking forward to that you've already put in motion or you guys have on the table that, that you want to see all the way through? You know, I think most of the items that we um, have on the horizon are, are some more amenities and refining those. You know, once you build something like our playgrounds and things at parks, um, there's a pretty clear rule. You know, let's say round number, it's every 10 years you must replace 100% of all the playground equipment because the liabilities and the warranties and the way laws work and insurance companies work, you, that technology is old, the safety standards have changed. So we always have those money set aside and we just have the discipline to keep those going. So the new projects, we do carve out. Occasionally you might have a one-time um, um, you know, bump of money that comes. Like this year, even though with the bad COVID, we had to cut two and a half million dollars in 90 days out of a $24 million budget at the end of the budget. Which so you had really to cut hard. out an additional 10%. Right. And we had to do that in, you know, in that last 90 days. And then we knew going forward in the new budget, we had to cut out $5 million. So on normal years, when we've done, we do very conservative bu budgeting that we would normally have maybe an extra million dollars at the end of the year. Now, most cities would throw it back in a hopper, spend the money. We never, ever do that. That takes discipline. It only goes to capital projects. So those are one-time expenses. Um, so our, on our capital list, there's a skate park we'd like to build. It's going to probably take us eight years to save the money to do that. It's not, uh, you know, it's a million and a half, two million dollar project. You know, that wouldn't, shouldn't normally, maybe that would have been a three, four, five year save. Um, but given where we're at, the cuts we've had to make, like I said, we've never laid off staff in 25 years. We just had to do that. There was no alternative. The good news is we were able to do that. The layoffs was actually not actually laying people off. It was retirement. We just had some of those people who had been here for 35 years who were thinking about next year, maybe early. So we put a small incentive to help them. And it, and it saved all of these great jobs. Now, we also have new opportunities for some of the younger folks to move up in, in management positions. But again, all under that um, philosophy and our species of that we save and do that. So we haven't really put anything off to the side. I mean, we've only been in this, this cycle for six months. We're actually probably going to see that the revenue that our, um, all cities are July 1st to June 30th. So as we get our audit done and see our revenues um, we're actually going to see a bump for the June 30th end of that year. But it's a false bump. So we're using that money to carry it over because the hit that we should have had because the state has a, 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 a full quarter, they're one quarter behind in paying cities for sure. share of sales tax, and then they told people, you don't, business, you don't have to pay your sales tax. So Yeah, it's a huge mess. Right. So all of that actually is going to show up this year. So we had to really be prepared for a, uh, for a drop in revenue. And, and I'll be honest, we have, we have a 40% cash reserve against our operating budget. We've never touched it. Um, and we're not going to touch it in this because philosophically, you could say, well, that's your rainy day fund. You're short on funds. Yeah, but if we're short forever touching that money, it's just carrying on a problem that we're not solving. So we had to make the tough decisions to solve it now. And if we stay in this position, we don't have to touch that because if we have an earthquake, likely right here, Calvary's right, fault. Right. If we have a major fire, yes, we're in the same high fire zone as all the fires that are happening today up in Napa. You know, we're estimating that in 30 days, we would burn through 100% of that cash just for one event. So in a way, it's become that kind of a fund. Yes, we'd probably get reimbursed over a four or five years for most of it, maybe from FEMA, you don't know. Um, so we're operating on that. The cuts that we made are cuts. We're not doing it on a temporary basis. We're, we're reorganizing, making, putting a little more workload on everybody's plate. Um, and you know, in the, we're not doing the raises, we're not doing all those other things. And 
you know, the, or, the way our organization is run, our employees, God bless them, they, it's paid for performance. You know, all the other cities around us have what they call COLAs, cost of living allowance. Employees don't consider that a pay raise. And it could be above inflation or inflation. So in, in the case, and, and bless the people that work for us, and when we advertise a job, we have two or 300 applicants. We are different, we're not in CalPERS, and we're not in all those, but it's a great place to work. And it's because of really the leadership of one person that, you know, I'm not it. It's Joe Calabrigo who lives here in Danville. Here's our town manager. He's been our town manager for just now 26 years. He's brilliant, he lives here like a lot of our staff. They know what it takes, and he has the same value propositions as you and I that live here. His kids grew up here, went to school. He wants the same things. And the people who work for us have that same philosophy. Gotcha. We're really fortunate. Here's a question for you. Um, I read the other day that California, by 2035, is going to be stopping sales of uh, internal combustion engine cars. Okay, And that's obviously going to change the face of... of of our transportation networks, right? I mean, we're going to stop having gas stations, or at the very least, we're going to see these charging stations really start shooting up. And that's a long-term shift in the way California and, and towns and cities really do business. What, what do you think with regard to the fires that we're experiencing what kind of shift do you see coming on a local on a local <clears throat> level to start addressing these? Because it's one of the things that a lot of my my neighbors and my wife, for instance, she's worried about fires, and I think justifiably, she's saying, "Hey, look, you know, we live all the way down here, and it would take a long time to get out if we had to go down Stone Valley or something like that." And she's just very concerned about it. And I keep telling her, "Hey, you know, there, this is not a problem that that people don't recognize. The the, the fire responses she has." Um, first alert or a pulse point, excuse me. Right. So she sees when fire trucks get called for things and their brush fires, things of that nature. Do you see a shift in, in the way Danville's going to be dealing with these things? Or are there, are there programs in place or developing ideas so that we can increase our fire responsiveness or fire preparedness? Is it going to be like everything else that you guys do, which is, hey, look, let's not be reactive. Let's be really proactive to this. Let's start fire abatement programs that are that are funded or, or different ways to incentivize local residents. What What's going in place to keep yeah. Danville away from going the way of Napa or, or these other places that were great places to live but just burned down? Right. Lessons learned. Um, you know, we're fortunate we haven't. But 100% of the credit when it comes to fire goes to our local fire agency. It's from, uh, the chief is uh, Paige Myers, lives here in Danville. Um, San Juan Valley Fire Protection District, bar none, is in the top three best funded, best, best run of the highest levels of certification in the United States. Their response to a fire, and I remember there was a fire that started on Elworthy Ranch, so that's an, almost a 500 acre parcel, just just grasslands. There's now 80 homes and a little small section of it. A fire started there. They set up a temporary um, water pond. It's an inflatable dice, got it filled up full of wire. They had that fire out faster than you could imagine. By the time people found out that fire was there, it was out. They have a reputation of helping because they have technology, they're progressive. You know, uh, in the Oakland Hills fire back in 93, the biggest problem was every agency showed up, nobody could talk to each other. They were all in different frequencies. And every company that sold them a radio, they said, oh, yours is only yours. Then you could only buy it from them. <sighs> the pivot we made here, and the fire department is the one that really woke us all up. They bought a, a command center, a portable truck, that could capture every frequency and they can then disperse back common so they could have 12 fire departments on a fire and actually talk to all of them. Fast forward, we then learned as a region and Joe Calabrigo, our city manager, was on the original committee that started it. So all of Contra Costa County, all of Alameda County and, and finally I think Sonoma um, County joined in, we started our own radio system. So our police department if our chief of police wanted to talk to every police officer in those counties, push one button. That was virtually, virtually impossible. You would have to have a phone. You would have to know their phone number. 
the communication systems that we have for response time, and we're still one of the few in the state of California, actually Senator Dianne Feinstein couldn't believe we were doing this and said if you can get two counties to do it, and you know at the time I think it was nearly 40 cities that agreed to go on this, she would help find the money and she did. And then we've, you know, it's an expensive system and we've, we're now completely revamping it, getting new equipment. So it's that, their response in mapping the, uh, the San Ramon Valley and how they look at those high fire service, making sure that we have multiple exits, entry points, escape routes. Their standards have gotten tougher. They've been tough to begin with on fire prevention and clearing. No doubt that's going to change because it's predicted. Climate change is happening. And, and the politics are, what caused it? Let's put that aside. It right. is happening. It's, it's happening just, no matter what. Whether it's natural or right. not. And if we, as public agencies, aren't prepared, then shame on us. So the fire department, all of us, are looking at ways. Right here in the Bay Area, we're predicted to be hotter and wetter. That's actually not good for fires. Think about it. If we're going to be hotter and drier, we're not going to have fires because nothing's going to grow. Right. But the worst thing we could be in is wetter and hotter. So our summer's going to be hotter. We're going to be wetter. The wetter we are, the more fuel grows. Right. The hotter we are, the more combustion we're going to get. Um, you know, that's like why in the East Coast, why don't you see fires there? It rains all summer long, and in the winter, everything's frozen. We're just in that wonderful climate zone, but we are getting hotter and we are getting wetter. And you can tell on the really drought years, if you have a few enough drought years in a row, fire, fire goes down because you don't have the fuel. So all of us, every single thing that we're looking at as we update our general plans, our emergency plans, what are we doing different? Um, you know, even in energy, um, you know, if we had a magic wand, we'd love to underground, you know, Danville, all of our new neighborhoods, like most cities, because that's, that's became the law, all of that's underground power. We need to have a law. It needs to be a statewide action. It's, a, it's probably a 20-year program. 20 years, and we as the public, it's got to come from someplace. We've got to pay for it. It's going to be on a PG&E &E bill or whoever provides your power. We've got to underground the power. First of all, it's cheaper to maintain. Right. It's a lot more expensive, first cost in, no question. But once it's in the ground, the maintenance is a lot better. The system ages better, and you eliminate the fires. We need to do that. They're just, you know, they're doing it as a favor, um, you know, for Paradise, California, but every city ought to be like Paradise right. in terms of getting it underground. We actually, just up the street, in, and again, my little neighborhood, we had, I believe it was five or six houses up, had a power line drop, right? Something happened, and literally the, this line drops in front of our friend's house, uh, maybe 200 yards up the street, and it made glass out of the gutter. Because yes. it, it heated up so hot in that the, the sand in the gutter turned just, I mean, it, all of a sudden, you're, yeah, you have this little shiny clump. You're like, what is that? And then you realize, <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. that's glass. And it was literally 30 feet from their, from their bedroom, right, from, from their kid's bedroom. They live in the back of the house. The kids happen to be in the front of the house. So, I mean, here we have these little, you know, five and six and seven-year-olds with power lines dropping. And I'm not saying anybody did anything wrong in that case. It just happened. But were it underline, or excuse me, underground, that would not be a concern, right? And luckily, their front and front shrubs were taken care of. And so nothing, nothing lit fire in their front yard, yeah. but it absolutely could have. And those are the types of things that people don't, um, excuse me, that, that contribute massively to prevention. Again, we're, we're talking about reactionary versus, you know, prevention. And, and if we could upgrade those types of those types of utilities, then we wouldn't have to worry about that. That was definitely one of the things my wife saw that. And she's like, oh, my gosh, like, look at all the power. And we have a power line running through or excuse me, across our front yard as well. Um, so, yes, those types of upgrades seem to be seem to be things that pay massive dividends down the road as far as not having to worry about not having to worry about those things. So, yeah, and you mentioned something that, uh, and I think the other thing that makes us a safe community for fires and things like that is is, is the partnership, um, and I talked about community policing, that's really a partnership with the community, mm -hmm. that, that your first call should be, when in doubt, please call the police. Mm -hmm. And that's not true of everywhere because their systems are overloaded. Here we want to know, we want to help. But it's the same way, we have so many eyes on the street, people who care so much, you know, you may say, oh, there's a fire just started. Oh, somebody else probably called because they're closer. No, when in doubt, you do that. It's our response times here are so good 
because people actually care about their community. They're here. We had somebody saw lights up the hill off a of Remington Loop the other night. Wow, there's no houses. We all hike up there. We know there's, well, how could there be lights up there? And is there somebody camping up there or whatever it was? Sure enough, made the call, go up there. And there were some people up there that had gotten stuck and it got dark and they were using flashlights to get down the hill. But it was so bright because the orientation lines up with going up the street, it looked like something was going on. You know what? When in doubt, call. Right. And, and that's really been what's so great. Um, and again, you, you, you have to really, you know, uh, when we can get back to the time where we can have, um, you know, face-to-face -face meetings. If you got kids, take them to go see our fire departments. They love to do it. The equipment they have, you don't realize all their equipment is four-wheel drive. I mean, who buys four-wheel drive trucks? Right. They do because, think about it, we're, we're in a valley. We're surrounded right. by these hills. They train and train and train up on some of the steepest mountains. In fact, uh, a friend of mine, I remember Rick Probert, um, a former chief, um, God bless him, he was up on a training mission. And sure enough, real life, they were pulling people up and down, fell, crushed his leg, broke his leg. Now they have a real rescue. But these guys and, and the men and women there every day are training to keep us safe. And they're forward thinking as the towns are and coming up with new, new master plans, new standards. Does our water system support it? East Bay Mud is a partner. John Coleman is our area. You know, we're begging them to put in permanent, permanent generators. They have portable around, and they keep arguing economics. But we say, if PG&E just does a rolling power outage, just because it's a high fire time and windy, sure. and then we have to wait for you because the supply of the water, people don't like to hear this in the summer, is maybe six to eight hours of water supply. I had no idea. It's because of the, trying to get those tanks. You know, the systems are gravity, so they got to pump at night, fill them up. They don't, maybe in some areas, because the growth, particularly Doherty Valley, or they didn't have enough tanks out there. So you have to worry. So we would rather have them, and this is, this is one of our weaknesses. That's the analysis. They did put a separate line in. It came in Crow Canyon. So we now have two sources of the freshwater supply in case there's an earthquake. It could cut one system off. We have that. You know, well done, East Bay Mud. But we want to see permanent generators with their fuel source and everything on site and not wait for that. Because it would automatically come on and the pumps are there. Right. Because now you have it. Oakland Hills Fire gave them a lesson. They ran out of water. And you can't pump uphill like that. Right. It's just, you know, it's just, it's the math. So technically all that water coming out of every one of those fire hydrants are fighting is a tank above them someplace. And right. when it ran out of water, the pumps had nothing left. They don't have any. There's no power to it. Yeah, them. right. The lines burned down or whatever. So, you know, it's just one of the things. We need to get the pressure on them to get permanent ones in the high fire risk. So here's the question that, I, that I've been asking a lot of people. The, the communication with the community around what you guys are doing, just like what you're describing. Hey, look, we're getting permanent pumps in place so that we can guarantee in a fire outage if we also have a fire. Generators. Excuse permanent. me, generators. Right. Generators. So we can run the pumps and, and we, can, we can have permanent fuel sources, or excuse me, water sources and all these things. It seems to be so lost, right? The, the, one of the things I was reading on a social media this morning. <laughs> I, I, I read. <laughs> oh, it's the worst. So I read... I read this one post on this specific group pertaining to education that said, okay, look, I don't think that the Board of Education knows that we want to go back to school. So please email and send this post to five friends of yours and have them send it to five friends. Here are the emails for all of the reps. Write them individual letters, right, and emails. So. It became, I was talking to a board member yesterday, they, they have sometimes 10,000 emails that flood in. And it could be because of these waves of, hey, let's band together and tell them what we think. And they don't know that we want to go back to school. Everybody wants to go back to school. There's not a person, there's not a teacher, an administrator, a kid that I've ever talked to that was like, you know, I could do this forever. There are some people that fare better than others, 
right. some people that function better, but nobody likes this style of this style of education. And to see that type of thing where somebody could promote the idea that the, those in charge don't know or aren't listening to us. And I feel like that's a type of a type of it's almost like a virus. Like people start spreading the idea around that it's like, oh, the town council's not listening to us. The town council's not taking action. Yeah. I spoke to one candidate recently who said, I don't think anybody's looking at what to do when things start getting colder as far as businesses downtown. I'm like, you don't think people are planning for this. How, how, is, how is that? And again, it, it, the opinion is the opinion. It's none of my affair. But how do you think we could improve communication with the community so that things like fire prevention, people feel like, okay, things are getting a little wonky, but Danville's on top of it, or things like safety in school, right? The, the, another issue is people, you know, with a police liaison. They say, well, not all students feel safer when there's a police liaison around. It's like, okay. That's not the point. We're not here to police you. We're here to build relationships and, and help mentor people or help, help uh, right. prevent things from happening. Um, how do we increase communication so that we don't have people spreading the idea that the town council or the board of education or, or whoever it may be, they're just not listening to us and they're not taking this seriously right. and they're not, they're not taking it's, action. Yeah, and, and you know, that's, and, and, and obviously people have their opinions, but, but when you see that, um, th to be honest, most of the time it's somebody who has an agenda and something they want to accomplish. So you have to discount everybody first to try to say, now listen to me because I know what I'm talking about and say, oh, they don't know what they're doing, they're not listening. Uh, well, first of all, just things, we liaison, and we've been doing this for 25 years, we meet with the school board, we meet with the superintendents, what's going on? We can't solve all their problems, but we can be a partner in it. We want to know what's happening. Same thing with the fire department. We meet with everybody to stay. East Bay Mud, all of these things. What we don't have, I personally have, because I've been around a long time, I have accumulated a list of 13,000 of, of residents that live in Danville. <laughs> 13, isn't 13, that like a thousand. third of the city or well, something? Well, there's 43,000 people, so, oh, so it's a lot pretty of emails. close. But I actually probably have more emails than the town. I can't legally give them those addresses. But what we do have, and, and um, I know how few we have. I mean, it's several thousand. But if people would sign up, we push out all the information. The things I'm talking about, we put out the updates on all of that stuff. Or we'd like to hear from you. You go to the website at... Um, um, danville.ca.gov so that's G-O-V um, right on the front page you can sign up for newsletters, you can sign up for agendas you can look at any meeting that's going on, any meeting that's ever happened in the past decade um, you can go watch it, listen to it on the specifics, but most importantly the only way the town can get emailed us is if people give it to us right. even through our recreation You know, we're, we're trying to pivot to ask You know, we did that some time ago would you like to receive information in general as well? Boom, now we can get, we can communicate with you because we really need to. We also went back to, we had eliminated um, a hard copy, it was called Danville Today. It was from the council and all of our departments. What are the new things happening? What's going, we eliminated that sometimes. And I remember it was three and a half years ago, I, I said, you know what, I think, I think we need to go back to some hard copy. You still find large groups of people that you need to get something in front of them and go, oh, I didn't realize that. And sure enough, we went back to a hard copy, mail it to everybody in town. We do it quarterly. Wow, the response was. And one of our messages is, please sign up. We can give you instant notices. You can sign up for the police one, which is great. You can find, hey, there's an incident. There's an accident down in Hearts of Diablo. Please stay away. Not real one. That's just right. an example. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't listen to that and think there is. But uh, we can give you those instantaneous notices. Uh, Jeff Gillette, who helps um, put out both from the town, council, or departments, but particularly from police, those notices, those are fantastic. So I think we do a good job. We just need to get more people to sign up for it. And, you know, people are worried. Over it. We just put out facts. You know, right. Jeff's job, he can't make any comment, like if it's on next door, any of those, because most of those are pretty wild, super story, wild, super wild storytelling stuff. So Jeff will only intersect. Here's the facts of what we know, and 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 make those less. Now on the other side, where somebody says, "Oh, the council's not listening," well, maybe the decision we made, that person didn't like it, and and they may have come to the meeting or they said, "Oh, you don't, 
you're not listening. It's, it's interesting. As much as California is left-leaning politically on a lot of things, property rights is an area that California is one of the toughest states on. So if you or I own a piece of property, I don't care how popular I am, whether I'm the mayor or just a council member, I don't have the legal right to take that away, period. So what we do have the right is to put standards and to put overlays. We can't ever prevent you from building, but we may, if we have design review control or if we have aesthetic control or we have setbacks, we'll use that to the standard of the high levels that Danville has established. And I started helping do that back in 1989 because I was a volunteer on Design Review and the Planning Commission and we started developing really tough standards. And those are to say that you can't build until you meet those standards. So, you know, on a single family home, it's pretty easy to meet. Most people here want to meet that. It's the commercial property sometimes Somebody say, wow, it took me 10 years to develop, or there was a residential property. It took 25 years. You know, somebody would say, wow, that's, you took those persons right away. Well, you know what? We had to philosophically get them around to, yeah, you have development rights. We can't take that. So when, when somebody says, oh, you voted for that project, why well, didn't vote? Like, for example, the McGee Ranch. I didn't vote to approve the houses. That was their right. In fact, they could have built more houses. What we were voting for was to take and force them to only take out of that 410 acres um, the town and East Bay Parks ended up with 381. So that uh, 29 acres that they got, that's what they got to build on. And they could only build on that. And the reason why they couldn't build the, I think they had, they had a legal right up to 79 or 76 and they built 69 or will. They couldn't fit them in there. So that's, that wasn't our problem. But we got for the public, so when you drive Diablo, in perpetuity, the way it looks today, it'll always look that way because they can't build there. But people think we voted, why didn't you just say no to the houses? That's not, that's not our legal jurisdiction to do that. It went to court, the court said, you don't have the right to take that away. So there were other projects that happened that way, but Danville has, for 25 years, those people tried to develop that property. Right. That's a legacy family. They didn't get any extra credit. They've been here for a hundred and something years um, as old farmers. So what did they get out of it? They still get to graze cattle on there in perpetuity. Right. So right, and Danville gets Danville gets something as well. So permanent the whole, open space. We get a trail right. that we've been desperate to look for. You can get bikes and pedestrians off of. Uh, you know, we just. Um, did a project here in the past two weeks. It's almost finished and redoing the bike trails out there. But you'll see when it gets to the creek going uh, towards Diablo Scenic, or before you get to uh, right at St. Timothy's, about where it ends. Yes. We're going to be able to ride in that area, jump across the street, and that bicycle trail and everything, it should be a win-win. There'll be no cars around it. It'll go all the way around back to as Diablo, um, past Diablo Scenic. It'll cut across in the safe location, goes back by um, Athenian School. Yes all on pathways that are already there. That's a win. But but there are some that thought, oh, well, you made the decision to build a house. No. Right, right. Not and true. again, you, you, the Measure Y was one of those tremendous miscommunications. And it, 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 was, a, it was a project and, a, and an issue that was just wrought with, with half-truths and yeah, some just bold Right. Right. Yeah. And, and again, you, that is their land. It's not like Danville was taking away their right the whole time. I mean, maybe they would have liked to build more houses, but it just didn't. The the way it was laid out wasn't going to work. But again, it. I've spoken with a lot of people about it, and it's so clear that to get down to the to the nitty gritty facts of what's real and what was what was not real. For the majority of people not relying on things like the the city website or or the city mailer, you get these just horrific kind of aggravating aggravating sound bites where it's like they don't they're not listening or they're they're taking away their right. And so you have people saying measure wise great, and you have people saying measure wise terrible, and then the truth lies in there somewhere where it's kind of like hey, it's not great or or terrible. We're just trying to trying to do what we can so to get everybody the best wins. Solution right. for Danville, and we always look at it. And I hope that anybody gets on the council that they say what will be best if they have a right. You legally have to respect it now. Now we agree to that. It's kind of like the pothole story I said. Okay, we agree it needs to be fixed. We agree that's your right. right. Now, 
here's these standards what we want you to, to meet. Those are tough. Elwithy Ranch, that was 500 acres. Um, East Bay Regional Park's got 480 acres. They had a right to build 80, I might be off a couple of, it's like 86 homes. And they built it on 12 acres. So the other is in perpetuity. So when you look, if you were standing at the freeway and look at the west side of Danville, you can see all this development up, way up the hill. Also, it drops down to barely at the freeway height and goes back up. That's what the town of Danville did. Had we incorporated before 1982, most of the west side would look more like that. The county was approving all those projects. We got in place, we have a hillside ordinance. You might have even 20, 30 acres up there, and if you have a right to build one house, you got one little tiny spot and the rest of it, you have to put a deed restriction in perpetuity that it can't be built on, and it gets a dedication to it. So Danville's, Danville's unique. What other city has 43% open space? But here's the bad part about that. And somebody said, well, why is it bad? It makes our property values go up every year because you can't build here. Our growth since the year 2000, so 20 years ago, our general plan said the town of Danville will be built out. So our population has barely increased 100 people per year. And now our population is starting to go slightly negative as we're aging out. And we'll probably average at 50. San Ramon, as a city, about the same size at the time, they were 45, we were 41. Um, they're 85, 86,000 people. And their growth is huge. And it's because of Doherty Valley, which they didn't approve, the county did that, but they, they inherited it. So Danville is built out. So when we talk about traffic and, oh, we're overbuilt, we're not. And, and, you know, another, if you don't mind. No, please. You know, so there's another project. And people call this, oh, there's a low-income project in, in town. I says, well, yeah, where is it? Oh, it's that new building. I said, the luxury apartment building by Trammell Crow that's behind Heritage Bank and Diablo, where the apartments rent from 22800 a month to 5800 and you got to have a, um, a $88,000 a year income to $150,000 a year income to qualify to rent from them. There are nine to 11, depending upon whether they make them low or very low, um, affordable units. And by the way, if it were under Danville standard that we've had for 25 years, 15% of every single project since 1995 built in Danville has affordable units. Greenbrook, all of Greenbrook was built. I think Braddock and Logan built most of that. That's how that company you know, made their fame of building greenways and stuff. It has more affordable housing in that. And people say, well, where is it? I said, the townhomes, the duplexes where they built on the corner lots. It's a smaller lot. The, the unit actually has a common wall, but each has its own individual address. The real affordable unit, and it's very low income, it's right by the old library on Laurel, award-winning project. And people look at it and go, well, that's a beautiful building. Yes. It's seniors. Yes. And people go, well, that's not. I don't mean that kind of housing. And I said, no, uh. I do. That is an award-winning, very low income. When that first opened about 12 years ago, it was like 400 and five, $480 to $520 a month to rent an apartment. Danville first. First choice was Danville residents. Right. And nobody complains about those residents. Not one person. And, and, and they are us. So in the same sense, that project got mislabeled. And people wanted to go with it. I still have friends say, yeah, when's that so-and-so low income? I said, it's not. It's a luxury apartment. You know, San Ramon, I think, has about 8,000 apartments. Danville has 400. Right. You know what? My son, daughter, could barely come qualify to live in them. They have pretty good incomes. But if they want to get a two-bedroom place and they need 150000 and they're very young, so no, that's not what people have described it but it you know and I get when you're against something you're going to use all of the the rhetoric and the things that do that that took a long time it took a long time for that property to develop it was their right we didn't make a decision on them building the units what we made the decision on is what it would look like what kind of open space would it have what kind of um, recreation facilities would it have um, play space for children would there be a bridge to connect to the library so we have a more pedestrian place? 
That's the only decision we made. We had no decision on them building apartments in there. That was their vested right. Right. And again, I think I think your point is is so well made, which is look, you can describe a project like that as low income housing. But that's really being disingenuous. Mm. It's because uh, you that's might have some kind of income qualification and that's fine for but nine to, of the units or for, 11. Right. So for 11 of them and People use that so aggressively to just throw a wrench in the works of of a lot of the larger projects. Because again, even if you have 11 units that are low income, you also have many more units that aren't low income. You'll make a return on those. We, and even with the 11 low income units, when's the last time you heard about somebody complaining about you know the mother-in-law moving in or, or okay. kids right out of college moving in? I mean, you want to be able to have a wide variety of residents. You don't just want residents between the age of 35 and 65 li- with very, very high incomes living here and exclude everyone else. Because again, you, then you get problems filling our schools. Then you get problems with the residents who do live here trying to find places out of the city to take care of their parents. And those types of things are just so unfortunate. And, it's a small percent. Right. It's a really small percentage. And again, for 25 years, and if you go back to the late 60s, uh, early 70s, how Danville was built, those people who were developing those signs, they thought that was the clever idea. Right. We'll build right. income groups. So today, there are a lot of negative connotations. But here's the other thing. And, and, and this is just facts. Um, the affordability of what they, somebody would say, a lower income unit in this small percentage. Um, and again, you can't tell where they are, what they look like. Um, it's based on the average income of our area. So an affordable unit in Concord is really affordable. In Danville, it's still $75,000 minimum per person. So one bedroom. So if you get, it's, it's affordable on paper. It's a little less, but it's still over two thousand dollars a month to rent that kind of a unit. Right. So it's all relative, and 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 you know what? We can say, hey, well, good for Danville. Higher incomes go up. That threshold keeps moving up proportionally with it. Um, so you know, again, but it still has to meet Danville standards. Right. Our standards are really high. But if you're going to build here, you're going to build quality. Do I like every project? And I am an architect, and I own a firm. Can't do any work in Danville, um, but. I'm proud of the standards that we have. And again, getting 43% open space, that's the reason why our property values are so high. We are built out and not going to change. You're going to see little properties redevelop, but you're not going to see neighborhoods being knocked down. All you're going to see is people reinvesting, as we've seen Cameo Acres, west side of Danville, particularly the northwest portion. People you know, have raised the property values that we are the highest property values in Danville. I mean, per square foot. It's higher, Alamo, very similar. Other postal codes that have Danville addresses, but they're not in the town of Danville, per square foot, they're less. So our property values, based on the decisions that we make, are going to continue to increase faster than anybody, provided that we stay safe, provided we keep supporting our schools, the best schools, and that we have the limitations on building that we do. One of the big questions, and I think it's one of the one of the last ones I can harass you to, uh, to answer here. I know you're limited on time. One of the things that I've heard a lot of people talk about is why doesn't Danville push back? Okay, so for instance, with the cell phone, with the cell phone sites, um, the cell sites with uh, uh, housing requirements pushed down by the state, with the lack of funding for our schools in this area, these are all things governed by bodies far larger than the Danville Town Council or the mayor. Is there... Is there a way where we can push back? Is there the will to push back against, say, the state or, or whatever right. governing body saying, hey, mm-hmm. Danville, you have to do this because you live right next to San Ramon and we're having them do this. And, and Danville right. says, well, we can't, we can't do, right? Yeah. So is there a way or is there the will to start pushing back a little bit on these things and say, hey, we, we really are underfunded, <laughs> Right? It, with schools. Yeah. We really are being asked to absorb too much. We don't have that much land or, or whatever it is. Yeah. No. Actually, that's a very good question. And, and the fact is that the town, um, regionally the town of Danville, particularly in Costa Costa County and the Tri-Valley area, we are the ones that spend more time on these statewide issues, um, particularly about the um, 
these affordable housing. They call them RENA numbers, and that's an acronym for Regional Housing Needs Allocation. So the state of California, through the state legislature, requires every metropolitan area, every group of counties, to say, okay, your population coming up, you have to have X number of units. Now, we don't build houses. That's not our job. We're not in the business of doing that. There are a few exceptions. San Francisco, San Jose, because of the nature of their cities and the age, they have housing, but they have different tax structures. But by and large, in Contra Costa County, we don't build houses. That's not our job. If you want to build in Danville, you've got to build to our standards. However, cities only exist because the state legislator allows us. So what they have told us, one, they can hold up all tax revenues, and people say, well, hold the line. Actually, they're not going to hold up the revenues. They just meet and decertify us as a city. We only exist. We don't exist because people want us to exist. Yeah, we were able to vote and do that, so we'd like to become a city. But ultimately, the state legislator looks at you as a city and says, you know what? You're not, you're not meeting our standards. We decertify you. They do that in one day. You don't exist as a city. That is their power. That's the way our Constitution is written. I spend personally, because I've got a housing background, I'm articulate, and I've been around long enough, I know. And Danville, more than any other council members, we have regional roles. Some of us got, it takes 10 years to even kind of reason a role. Otherwise, you get on, get off the council, and you don't even know what happened. You didn't even have a say in what was happening. So our role at the state legislatures, those particular, I'm not going to name them, but let's just say those um, assembly members and senators out of San Francisco that think they're smarter than all of us, know us better than any other community around because we're the ones that are there testifying to create factual numbers of how we do it and how any other community can do that and to make sure that they know we don't build housing and you can't force us to do it. Can we meet it? Yes. We have an inclusionary housing ordinance and I ask you, as I said earlier, where's the affordable housing in Danville? And every time somebody picks it, I say, wrong. You have no idea. And that's our job, to make sure that it's planned, not that we build it, planned in ways that you can't tell. It's the smaller lot in the subdivision. Every subdivision based on our hills, there's a smaller lot. It's a little smaller house. And again, out in the middle of Danville from Diablo Highlands through Greenbrook, there are big houses and small houses. My neighbor on one side is the exact same house on the west side and the other side. So the house that's 50% bigger than me, what is it? It's worth 50% more. So we took an approach to how to make it affordable by more design than it is by some other artificial lab label. And it's worked really well. Never had a complaint. Nobody knows. But when a project that gets labeled as, oh, it's an apartment, that's a temporary resident, um, and there's a, it's going to be all affordable, they're going to be low, that's absolutely a false statement. And there are people who are against it, and their fear, they say, oh, well, I don't care what you say it's going to be. I said, it's factually not. And first of all, in Danville, you couldn't afford to do it. You couldn't pay for that project. Right. The revenue, when they had to pay, they paid 20, almost $24 million for three acres. That's $8 million an acre. You have to get a return on that. And the return is they have to have uh, apartments at $2,800 to $5,800 a month, and they will all be filled up. But state law does come in. We have found the ways to make state law comply. That's going to be a battle. But here's what's even more important. You know, the governor, God bless him for trying to be somebody to help for affordable housing. We need 180,000 units a year. Answer this question to me, and this is rhetorical. The state of California, through all the cities and counties, our approvals, there's a backlog of over 640,000 housing units, and they're not built. That's a three-and-a-half-year supply. And I keep challenging him. I can tell you why they're not built. It has to do with the economics. It has to do with the assessment fees that our special districts put on, all of those. It's not cities. We've approved them. So quit picking on us. We are not the problem. The finance, financing mechanisms aren't there. But then a pivot to a federal law. So the federal communications, FCC, has had since the 1990s when cell phones came out. They set up the bandwidth. They set up the standards. They did the scientific testing. You can't go over these frequencies and do all of that. So we are subservient to that. state of California has that adopted. So when small cell sites come in, there is both fact and fiction in that. 
But if a operator comes in, they have their licenses from the state and the federal government, legally there is nothing we can do or any city to stop them from building if they meet the standards. Our job is to make sure are they below those transmission standards? Can we verify it by a third party independent? Do they meet all of those um, um, standards that are legal? We have no legal authority. I would like to have some authority in a whole long list of areas. And I sort of joke, if you, if you want to make me the king of Danville, <laughs> I can do a lot of things. But I bet in that role, I'm going to make decisions you don't like. So under a democracy, our forms of government are that we have laws and rules. Now. I happened to be on the statewide committee um, that represented the 482 cities that helped file the lawsuit against the FCC saying we need more local control in making these decisions. They won't change the standards for transmission. So what people are saying, oh, these transmissions are going to be harmful. Science says no. FCC says that they're below these levels, absolutely not. We don't have the authority wishful thinking otherwise to go beyond that. But we did sue. That lawsuit took two years to get through. And the ruling just came out on the preliminary ruling is they gave us back some right on aesthetics for local control and absolutely zero say we cannot legally talk about it. We can't mention it. Anything to do with the health of those systems provided they meet those standards, period. So as much as we want, and somebody says, well, I want you to do it anyway. Well, I, and I've told people this, and if you are elected, you're sworn to uphold the Constitution and the laws, you cannot knowingly violate the law. Right. Now, we can sue, which we did, and Danville participated on that. We've sued on regional development. We sued to help City of San Ramon to stop the Doherty Valley or get it modified to a project that, that would work better, both with um, retail and its impact on our schools and all of that. In the same way, we were one of those cities, and I was fortunate because I've been around long enough. I got on that statewide committee, and I happened to be the chair of it. <laughs> so I had a little more voice. So Look Little Danville, out of 482 cities, has a lot stronger voice than that. We, as also as a community, not all cities do this. Even with our limited resources, we saw the value that we have a lobbyist, a company we hired that represents us in Washington, D.C. to go before those hearings so we don't have to spend all the time going back and forth. And we also have that same lobbyist is really good in the state of California. Rare to find somebody that's good in both arenas. I personally know the council members, Karen Stepper, all we spend more time than we should be in Sacramento testifying against these crazy ideas that they're doing. They hear us and I'll be honest, it was COVID's the only thing that slowed down. If the laws that they had on the books this year got passed, I tell you what, it would change what Danville would look like. We would be in constant lawsuits, or they'd end up decertifying as a city. we got to elect people in our regional levels, get involved, pay attention. What promises will they make about leaving local control? Local control, at least even if you don't like your decision, at least you have somebody to talk to come to a meeting. We don't make easy decisions. It takes years for us. It took 10 years to approve the, the McGee project. 10 years. I tell you what, we had a lot of public hearings and a lot of opportunity for input. But at the legislature, when they go there, they can close the doors by law, meet in secret, make a decision, and they'll tell us later. You can't do that here. Right. Well, at the very least, that's a benefit to everyone. Yes. I, because I was, again, talking to a uh, talking to some people and they said, well, look, there are these back backdoor deals going on with the cell sites or this was somebody got somebody got a bribe here. I'm like, I, you actually can't do that. You cannot talk. People want to close. discount the person right. because they don't like the decision. And that right. that is really hurtful when somebody says, oh, somebody did this to you. That, that's just, you know, the transparency of all of us and what we do. I mean, I wanted to have an office so I don't have to drive for 25 years in Danville. I was prohibited by law of having my own building. My wife and I wanted to buy a small little building. I was going to move my main office into this building. And I'm prohibited by law. I mean, there was a case of something happening at a shopping center in my neighborhood. I live too close to that. And the laws are clear. Oh, by the way, none of those laws apply to the state legislature. I didn't tell you that. Oh, and my campaign disclosures are all local people. It's, it's there. You, it's, anybody wants to look it up. It's friends and neighbors. That's it. It's all that transparent. Plus, we get audited. Oh, 
oh, by the way, that doesn't apply to the right. state legislature. Right. They pass the laws to make themselves look good like they are. Follow the money. I ran for state assembly just on principle. Took no money from anybody else, only money around here. Um, another person, I spent $225,000, a lot of my own money. The other person spent $12 million. I got like 9,800 votes. They got 20,000 or 19,000 votes. Wow. Even $12 million didn't buy it. And 75% of that money, you don't even know the people. You've never heard of them. They don't have anything to do with this area. So follow the money in that case. And you can look up what any of us do. It personally costs me and any council member five to $15,000 a year to be on this council. I have to pay for my own cell phone, I, my email list. You know, it's on constant contact. I've collected those names. That, that's $2,400 a year for that. We don't get anything. We get a small taxable amount of money. It was $790 a month. So when somebody says you're doing it for that, no. It's cost my company personally from my time away $3.5 million. But I'm passionate about making. My father came from a humble family, didn't have money. All he did was help people. He was a plumber. He went out. He gave away free plumbing every weekend to anybody that needed help. And by the way, I can fix your toilet too. I was his little it. helper. <laughs> let me tell you, that's not a joke. I hate doing that, but I happen to know how to do it. My point is, is you have to be on the council. It's not politics. And the day it turns to politics, Danville's in trouble. Yeah. And, and every day we're not on the front page of the newspaper. We're doing a good job. If we show up on the front page, it's because people said who, what, People are just arguing. We're not sticking to the facts. It's right. public service. But. Well, thank you for what you do. And thank you for taking the time today to Todd, talk about thank you. I, I, you know, it's, it's great for the work that you do and, um, you know, helping uh, get voices out in the community. Um, I appreciate all the questions, and I really enjoy the time. And, you know, thanks for the, what you do to help our, our young students <laughs> achieve better, <laughs> your tutoring, all of that. Uh, You're just so talented at that. And I, keep checking in on them. I appreciate sure it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody.